Good morning and welcome to Redeemer's Church Online. We are so grateful that you are all joining us this morning. Good morning to you on Facebook as well as our Redeemer's Online platform. If you are joining us from there, I want you to know that you have access to our sermon notes. If you go to the notes section, um, you can also find links to various sources as well as links on ways to give and our worship set that you can listen to later. You can also follow along with your Bible. It's connected to that platform, so it's a great way for you to follow along during Pastor Nick's message today. So get comfortable, grab some coffee, and we hope you enjoy service. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the new revamped Redeemers Online service. Um, we're glad you're watching. We're glad you're here. Um, we'll give you a little time to just get logged in and get everything set up, but I just wanted to share a little bit this morning um, as we get ready to do musical worship here, um, a little bit from Psalm 150, um, that it reads, Praise the Lord. Praise God in his holy temple. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his powerful acts. Praise him because he is greater than anything else. And I was just reading this this morning and thinking about how God has moved in life and even in these absurd circumstances that God is still moving. Um, so I just want to encourage you to take some time just think about the powerful acts that you've seen in God, God move in your life. Um, and we're just going to give some time to praise him. So let's give a word of prayer before we get started. Um, and we'll get with it. Lord God, we just love you. Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for this time. We thank you for the gift of music, Lord, and we thank you for your word. God, I pray that you'd be honored in this time, Lord, um, and that, yes, this would be a, a joyful sound to you, Lord. We love you, and we praise you. Say this in your name. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. 
We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Oh, fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on God is good this morning. Give him some praise. The wind is watching every gesture of your hand. Waves of Collapse at your command. I know tomorrow when the pressure rushes in, you'll be there to rescue me again. What a mighty God! song of heaven and my soul will sing the same oh jesus christ name above all names
Hear from me to not believe, even when my eyes can't see. When this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea.
My eyes are on you Through it all, through it all it is well Through it all, through it all My eyes are on you And it is well Good morning again to our Facebook friends and those of you joining us on our Redeemer Church platform. We hope that you enjoyed worship and we get to hear from Pastor Nick in just a moment. But first, I want to share with you about this exciting way for you to stay engaged and connected throughout the week, and that is Homegrown. This is a special page on our website for you to access at any time during the week. You can find resources for your kids, um, ways to lead your children, and for you to grow deeper in your faith now that we're all finding ourselves with some more extra time on our hands and some more time at home. So if you are on our platform, just find the home button. It'll take you directly there. If not, you can head over to redeemerschurch.com forward slash homegrown and find everything that you need there. Now I'd like to invite you to hear from Steph as she shares more about children's ministry. Adventure has got you covered. Each day we'll post something to help you lead your kids as they grow in their faith. Each day will be a different post. We've got Memory Verse Monday, Talk It Out Tuesday, our curriculum on Wednesday. There'll be a craft. There's something different every day. If you go to our website, you'll find the content. Redeemerschurch.com forward slash homegrown. Again, great opportunity for you guys to help lead your family and your kids as they grow in their faith. Today, after Pastor Nick's sermon, click on the Home tab and you'll jump right into a pre-recorded kid service and we'll have that there for you every Sunday. All right, heading off to what's next with students. As with everything else, Redeemer Students looks a little bit different now. Every Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. on redeemerstudents.online.church, we're gonna be hosting a live feed with a sermon, with message notes, and also a live chat so we can all stay connected. Whether you're with MSO or RSM, I'd like us all to be on that one platform Wednesday nights at 6.30. For any more information on that, you can check out the Instagram or Facebook page at Redeemer Students. Also, Redeemer's College is on hold, so I'm going to be posting devotionals Monday, Wednesday, and Friday on the Redeemer's College Instagram, so just comment and stay connected. Guys, if anybody needs anything from students to college, please reach out to Redeemer's via the Nehemiah Network. Can't wait to see you all when we're back. Thanks, guys. Hey everyone, even though we are not meeting physically right now, it doesn't mean we can't stay connected. If you are struggling with an addiction or a compulsive behavior, anxiety, depression, just life on life's terms, we're still here for you. We have CR support groups that are meeting by text and over the phone, even some groups that are meeting online and you can be a part of it. Um, if you're interested, call me at the church, send me an email, matt at redeemerschurch.com. I'd love to hear from you. And now, Here's Megan with the Nehemiah Network. Do you need a meal delivered? Prayer and encouragement? Help going to the store? Or anything else? Please submit a need through the Nehemiah Network. You can find this page at RedeemersChurch.com forward slash homegrown. Or if you are available to help out in any way, please fill out the form. Please let us know how we can help you. And now to Pastor Nick. Thank you for joining us. I just want to remind you that there are still ways to give to support the mission of the church so we can continue to expand our reach to reaching people all over the city and beyond now. Uh, you can give online at RedeemersChurch.com. You can text our text to give number or still send in checks to the office, and that'll help us continue to do the work that God has given us. Uh, I want you to stay after the sermon that's coming so that you can see a weekly challenge that you can continue to talk about with others around you and continue to dig deeper into God's word. We'll see you then. Good morning, Redeemers Online. Y'all ready for the word? All right, <laughs> let's get it. We're going to read out of James today. Our uh, sermon is called The uh, Pros of Problems. And so if you want to open your Bibles, open your apps, whatever it might be, it's James 1 we're going to be uh, teaching out of. And we're calling it The Pros of Problems because James is addressing uh, a scattered people 
who were in Jerusalem. They were God's people, but they had been scattered by persecution to different lands. They'd been facing these amazing trials where Stephen had probably just been killed as a martyr, and they were run out of their city, uh, and they are all over the place trying to figure out what does it mean to be Christian in a place in this diaspora where you've been dispersed throughout countries. And so we're going to read out of James 1. And here's what James 1 says. He says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that, say so that, you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all that they do. We're going to skip to verse 22 and verse 25. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in all that they do. This is the word of the Lord. So we're in this sermon, The Pros of Problems, and one of the things we're looking at is, is James says that, that consider it pure joy when you face trials. And you read this and go, how do I deal with problems in that way? How would I be joyful? How would I be excited or okay when I'm facing trials and problems? How can this be a good thing when bad things are happening, right? Why God? Why God would you allow certain things in my life? And that's one of the things, if you've ever struggled with faith, if you've ever been agnostic or, or struggled in your doubts about the Word of God, whatever it might be, that's one of those questions. How, God, there's stuff in your Bible that's hard to understand. Lord, there's things in the world that are hard to understand. How and why do you allow this to happen? And yet then we have James, who he's not speaking from some high society. He's speaking from this place of watching his church be run out of Jerusalem. So why is he saying this? And here's what we can learn. In stranger times, when we are facing problems, one of the things James and the rest of the Bible teaches is that problems can test the genuineness of your faith. They test the genuineness of your faith. Problems reveal temptations and weaknesses. Now, here's what this means. See, it's easy to go around and, and feel like everything is all right when everything is going right. You know what I mean? It's easy to see, feel like I am a great leader when everything you're doing is working, when the economy's good, when everything's, you know, just smoothly happening. It's easy to go, man, I'm really good at this. But what happens when things go south in your country or in your business or whatever? What kind of character comes out at that moment? See, it is those trials and tribulations that actually test to see what kind of person you are, what kind of leader you are, what kind of character you have. So when things go bad for some, they say, hey, this is my fault. I've got to figure out how to fix this. I'm going to lead you. I'm going to help you. We're going to take the sacrifices necessary to do what is right. But other leaders, their character is seen and they start blaming other people or other countries or whatever it might be or other businesses. They don't take responsibility. So character is revealed in those times when bad times come. Same thing goes with a marriage. It's easy on a honeymoon to say, this is so great, right? It's easy at that time. I can't tell you how many times I, I, it's the hardest thing in the world to do premarital counseling because you cannot convince these people that it's going to be hard. They're just like, no, we're just going to love each other forever. It's going to be so good. And I'm like spending half of my time going, can you just pretend that it's not going to be good? 
so we can work through this. And they just can't see it, but then two years later, they're in my office again for something completely different. Why? Because it takes trials. It takes tribulations for us to realize that there were some things in me that weren't good for my spouse. There were some things in me that made relationships incredibly hard. It takes trials for us to test the love and see what it's really there and test the character. The same thing can go with your faith. It is easy to love God when you are too blessed to be stressed. It is easy to love God when you prayed and it happened exactly the way you prayed for it. But when things don't go your way, what comes out of that heart of yours is a test to your faith. And, it, and you discover things in it that reveal that, man, I had some beliefs that were faulty. I had a friend, some of you may know, Jeff Harrington, a former pastor here, and he used to say, if your beliefs cannot go to another country and still be valid, you probably are wrong in your understanding of your faith. That's a paraphrase. But here's what he meant. If you have some fundamental belief and faith that if I love God, things are going to go well for me. If you believe some of these twisted doctrines that if I love God, I'm going to be wealthy. If I love God and have faith, I can't get sick or whatever it might be. Then take that to a third world country and preach that garbage. And when you face trials and tribulations and pain and you realize there are some faithful people who are living in abject poverty. Your beliefs can't transfer to a different situation. So these tests, these challenges, these hardships actually reveal the faultiness in what you believe. When you find some of the most faithful people, as I have, who have cancer, and yet it doesn't get cured, even though they are more faithful even than me, you realize that can't be a true belief. And that is not what the Bible espouses. So it is hardship that reveals brokenness and faults and fundamental flaws. See, God doesn't tempt us. That's what James says, that problems reveal temptations and weaknesses. But the thing is, James says, God doesn't tempt us. So what does this mean? He's not saying he wants bad things to happen to you, but he allows things, and he doesn't tempt you. But here's what that means. When bad things happen, you and I get tempted. Here's what that means. When bad things happen in my marriage and it's no longer happy, I am now tempted to leave. I am now tempted to walk away. I am now tempted by other things because things are not going the way I planned. When things go bad in my faith, I am tempted to say, forget about it. I'm going to go do my own thing. I'm going to chase something else. When things go bad in my economy, I am now tempted to throw myself at the altar of mammon and say, give me more. See, it is easy to praise others and praise God when they're good. But it is trials that reveal the things that are truly within our hearts that tempt us. I don't know if you've uh, ever heard of a stress test, but there's multiple versions of a stress test. So, if you remember, Tesla introduced their Cybertruck, and it was supposed to have bulletproof glass that could not shatter. And in the front of millions of people watching them act like they're going to shatter it with a, with a metal ball, it actually cracked. This was a stress test that didn't go right. It was a fail. What did it reveal in front of all these people? There was a fundamental flaw, even though it was supposed to not do this. There was a fundamental flaw when put under pressure. And they didn't see that flaw until something bad happened. Right? Right? There was, a, um, there was a car that was, I, I believe it was called the Ford Sierra, and it was put into a crash test. This is a stress test. Is there anything, before we send this out to market and put people in it driving 60, 70 miles an hour, what happens when we run it into a wall? Well, this isn't actually the Ford Sierra, but this one was a fail. It went all the way into the cab. But the, false, the Ford Sierra one I watched was a test. And when they tested it with a stress test, the steering wheel was angled in such that when it came in, it decapitated the dummy and went all the way back into the back seat. 
It was so dangerous, and but on the surface, you didn't realize how bad this car was. There was a fundamental flaw, and the only way you could discover internally what the fundamental flaw was was not by looking at it, but by seeing it go through trials and stress tests. If you have ever had issues with your heart, they'll give you a stress test, a cardiac stress test. A cardiac stress test, and this means... You can't look at somebody and know what's going on in their heart, but push them a little bit. Put them through stressful exercises, and they'll monitor you while you're going through it. And what will they discover? They may very well discover that you have a fundamental flawed heart, fundamentally flawed heart. And if you don't do something about it, you could be stressed one day, and it could be completely catastrophic. So they put you through a stress test now so that there is not a catastrophe later to reveal these deeper things you can't see on the surface. See, that's like God. He doesn't desire problems. He doesn't desire pain. But there is something about human nature that we cannot change or accept our fundamental flaws or even desire God sometimes until we're put under that stress test to see what is really, truly genuine. That is like God. He tests the heart. In fact, Proverbs says that the crucible is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. The crucible and the furnace are these things you stick silver in and it brings impurities that you could not see that were inside it. It brings impurities to the surface so that it can be cleansed, so that it can be perfected, so that it can be pure. And it says, yes, the crucible is for silver, the furnace is for gold, but God is doing that to our hearts, not because he despises you, not because he doesn't care what happens to you, but because he really does. Because he knows that if this doesn't get addressed, the internal things you you cannot see, your neighbors cannot see, the people around you cannot see, if those aren't put to the test, they will eventually be a fundamental flaw that ends in catastrophe. James says if you follow these temptations, it eventually births death. And so we need trials to elicit the temptations and, and the yearnings and the secret yearnings and the secret thoughts to reveal the things that God wants to address so that we don't continue to experience failure and and catastrophe. So here's what happens when, when... when trials come, they test the genuineness of your faith. And when the genuineness of your faith is tested, that leads to producing a stick to of your faith, which will produce a matureness of your faith. A stick to of your faith. Here's what that means. What does James say? He goes... Pure, you can have pure joy in trials. That sounds ridiculous, but why? He says because trials will lead to perseverance, that you will endure the struggle. And if you learn to stick to it, if you learn to endure and persevere, that it is going to bring maturity in you. It's going to transform you. It's going to purify you like gold. If you learn to stick to it, The word for mature, which is what he's saying, like this will end in maturity. If you can hold on and see God in the midst of trials and see and say, God, what are you trying to reveal in me? He says, it's going to lead to your perfecting, your fullness, your completeness. You will have no lack. And I'll explain what that means later. But this word for matureness means you'll be unwavering unwavering, undivided. Later, he says, people who doubt and aren't really in with God, you know, they're half in, half out internally. He says, you are like the sea. You are pushed back and forth like waves with every blowing wind. And many of you, you know that that is the case. I've been living this life, and one day I'm up, and one day I'm down. One day I'm excited, one day I'm depressed. One day I'm in love, one day I'm wanting to run for the hills. Like I am thrown, my faith is strong, I don't even want to be with God at all. Like I am, it's a thrownness, I'm just thrown by every gushing change and wind. 
So when he says you will have maturity, he says you will be strengthened to such a degree that you will not waver back and forth like that, that you will have this sustenance to who you are in your faith. This is the words he used, which I just love. He says, let perseverance finish its work. Let perseverance finish its work. That means don't cut it short. Don't stop it just because it's uncomfortable. That means seek God and seek joy in things that you are not happy about. That means seek his wisdom. Let perseverance finish his work. See, here's one of the problems. We often sacrifice maturity for false security. Or as Bon Quiqui would say it, we sacrifice maturity for false security. We sacrifice maturity. We could be growing and changing and being strengthened so we don't waver, but instead we go, man, I am uncomfortable. I need something to secure me. And you know, there are so many ways that we stop short. Anytime you and I experience pain, we are so unaccustomed as Americans to experiencing discomfort that we try to do anything we can to shut it down. I don't want to feel it. I don't want to think about it. Let's not talk about it, whatever it might be. There are so many ways in which we do that. Here are some. That here's often how we deal with problems. Distractions and avoidance. Distractions and avoidance. I don't know what this might be for you, but as soon as you start getting uh, uncomfortable, as soon as you start feeling this, like, like something's wrong or a sad or broken moment, what do you do? You look at your phone. You scroll Facebook, look at other people's bad lives so you don't feel bad about yourself. You know, whatever it might be, maybe it's TV and entertainment. I just, wanna, I just don't want to think about it. I don't want to see it, so I don't sit in it. I don't deal with it. I just get on my phone. Another way is we, we numb ourselves. You numb it. That could be self-medicating. That could be drinking. That could be sex. That could be shopping. I just numb myself. I just got, if I buy something new, I won't think about what I've lost or the feeling of loss or the worries I'm having. If I can go have fun at a bar, maybe I'll not have to think about that I feel lonely at home, whatever it might be. Here's a fun one. We normalize dysfunction. This is a way to avoid dealing with problems. I'm experiencing some problems in life, at work, in my marriage, uh, in myself. I am having personal issues. I'm having mental health issues, whatever. It, you know, let's normalize the problem. Whatever it might be, we normalize it. Like, how about this? That's just the way I am. That's my personality. I was raised with a father like that. That's just how I am. You know, that's just, I'm just a man. That's just how men do things. We normalize dysfunction instead of looking at ourselves going, you know what, maybe I'm unhealthy. Maybe I'm emotionally unhealthy. Maybe I'm physically unhealthy. Maybe I need to address it. The other thing is we insulate ourselves. I was talking to somebody about this and they were saying, you know, the way I avoid dealing with issues and problems and sadness and trials is I just try to never be around them. And so I'm going to live in my gated community. I'm going to send my kids to private school. I don't want people talking about things that differ with my understanding of the world. I'm got, we're not going to watch television. I'm going to have a lot of wealth. If I can build a lot of wealth, I can keep myself away from problems. And if I can just insulate myself enough, just only spend three, four days at church, you know, if I can just insulate myself enough, then I won't have to deal with the problems of the world. I won't have to see the pain of brokenness, of poverty, and whatever else is going on. We also deal with things like false positivity, and false positivity is not, it can come across as really godly or really good or what have you. But here's what it might sound like. I'm fine. But it's a way to say I don't want to address what I'm feeling or what I'm struggling with. I'm fine. In fact, we can get super spiritual about it. You know, God is good. God is good. Well, yeah, he is. That doesn't solve your issues, Becky. 
yes, God is good, but that's not a way to, you, that doesn't, you don't use that to avoid saying, man, I'm hurting. I'm in pain. Man, I'm struggling. Lastly, short-term fixes. If anybody's like me, here's how you avoid problems. Now, here's the thing. I actually don't avoid problems. Sometimes I run into them, but I don't run into them as if I'm running to God. I run into them saying, how can I fix this as fast as I can? Short-term fixes. I'm going to fix your problem, your problem, my problem. Let's all fix it because I don't want to deal with it anymore. But I'm not looking at the deeper issues, and I'm not asking God, what do you want to teach me here? I just want to fix it so I don't have to stare it in the face anymore. So I don't have to listen to that voice in my head. See, there's a lot of ways in which we deal with problems to avoid them. But what does James say? The word is so interesting. He says, let perseverance finish its work. See, this is how you will be made complete and mature. Stick to it. Seek godly wisdom and let him reveal what is in you. Stick to it. But the word let, it is an active imperative. It means our nature is to do the complete opposite but sit, like, opposite of sitting in our issues. Our nature is to avoid it at all costs. So we have to actively choose to let myself sit and persevere through something instead of running from it. It is an active choice to say, God, show me, I'm going to listen, I'm going to pray until you reveal what you want to reveal in me. I'm not going to run from it. It is in every one of our natures, in all these ways to run from it. And it says, let, active imperative. You have to choose to let yourself stick to it. If you, have, if you, if you can endure, then you can mature. But if you cannot endure, you will not mature. If you run from it and shut it down quickly, that will stymie any change in growth that is happening. So we can see this in our prayer lives. We can see this in our daily lives. I often seek money to fix my problems. Maybe you seek relationships to fix your problems. Anything you can, I just got to get a new one, I got to get more, get a new job, if I get, get that promotion, whatever it might be, I want to address whatever I'm feeling inadequate in, and if I can just keep getting these things, yeah, you might get them, but you will remain immature because you've never looked inside and said, what is at the root of all my chasing? It's like ever-shifting waves. Things come and they, things go. If there's anything we can learn at this time, it's that everything that we thought was solid and building up and going to protect us and going to take care of us comes in waves. And it leaves just as quick as it came. It is unsteady. It is shifting. And you know what? The, what I've learned, even when things are good, there's always a lack so I get the job I want, but I'm discontented over here. I get the, the spouse I want, but then I'm discontented with my job. You know, it's like there's always a lack. It's never enough. I'm going to give you a challenge. I want you to think about the times that you have truly changed. I mean, those times in your life that are so poignant that they just changed the way you viewed the world. It humbled you. It changed your personality in some way. It changed the way you see faith. It changed the way you love. Whatever it might be, think of those moments in time that had such an impact on you that you were like, I have been changed by this moment. And write it down. And you know what you're going to find? Nine times out of ten, it was something you would have never wanted in your life. It was pain. It was trial. It was struggle. I had somebody say, no, some of mine were good. It's when I went and served people in poverty. I'm like, you're staring at poverty. That is pain. That is trial. It changes. It shifts you. It shifts you, but it's, it's still a trial. It may not be yours. Nine times out of ten, it's going to be things that you said, you would have said, man, I don't want to ever go through that. 
and yet you are only shifting and changing and becoming closer to God or becoming a greater, greater relational person because of those moments, because of that str- trial. That's the twistedness of it. It's not that God wants you to have problems. It's that you and I don't change without them. Think about the most amazing people in your, that you can think of in the world, in the history of the world, the ones that you go, man, these were godly, just beautiful people who just ex- exuded love and grace, who just exuded the, like this, this human being you just wanted to be like. They were not the well-to-do. Guarantee it. They weren't the rich. They weren't the comfortable. Who comes to mind for you? Mother Teresa. Martin Luther King, Jesus, these were people of suffering. People who entered into the fray of the world's biggest problems. People who, in many ways, gave their lives or absolutely gave their lives. And yet these are the people that exude the characteristics that everybody knows, even if you're not a Christian watching this, you know, man, that is an an excellent human being. These were people of suffering, of trial. And so what does James say in our text? Those who have learned to persevere, to stick to it, and mature, these people don't pray for short-term fixes. They don't pray for things that are just going to come and go with every passing recession and job change. People who are mature pray for the only things that can last. And what are those according to James? What is that according to James? He says, pray for wisdom. He says, if you're mature, you'll ask for wisdom. Capital W, wisdom. Our text says that that is what God wants to lavish on you. He wants to give you an abundance of wisdom. He's just waiting for you to ask, for you to seek him. He says, I will pour it out on you. You know why God, when I I just balk at the idea of God wanting us to all be rich? Because like 20 times in the Bible, he tells us those who get rich neglect me, forget about me. They reject me. They don't want me. It's not that God doesn't want you to be happy. It's just that he knows that if he gives you everything you wanted, you will walk away. And he knows that eventually that fundamental flaw within you is going to destroy you. He loves you that much that he knows that the things you're praying for will sometimes destroy you. And actually what you don't want is what you really need to bring you to a place of desiring the only thing that really matters. The wisdom and knowledge of God. So what is wisdom in the Bible? It is Christ himself. In fact, here's what Paul says in Colossians 2. He says, he's praying about these people that he has raised up in church, and he says, oh, I want them, I I hope that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of knowledge and wisdom. Like, he says, it is in Christ in which all the knowledge and all the wisdom of God is encapsulated. That if you just set your eyes on Jesus, that that is the wisdom of the age. In fact, Proverbs 8, most people don't know this, there is a creation account in Proverbs 8. And it tells us that wisdom, capital W, was with God at the creation of the world. That wisdom is Christ. It is the knowledge, it is the mysteries of the universe. And he says, all you got to do is set your eyes on Jesus. Ask him for wisdom and he is going to pour it out on you. Ask him for money and he may know that that's not what you need. Sometimes it is. But that's what we pray, isn't it? Our prayers say a lot. We go, God, I'm uncomfortable. Please make me less uncomfortable. God, I want this small thing that will really fulfill my identity if I get it. And yet he's going, no, it's going to crash on you. You're going to be like a wave in the sea just coming and going and falling and rising. So what is matureness in faith as we learn it here today? It's single-mindedness on God's with us-ness. 
It says that God in the person of Christ is with us. He walks with us. It is in his very nature that he longs to be by your side. And why does that matter? Because it doesn't matter if times are great, God is with you. And when times are awful, God is with you. Whether you are excited about life or depressed about life, God walks with you. We have Jesus Christ who came and suffered mightily. Who came and was rejected by everybody he loved. Who came and hung on a cross. Who came and was rejected by the very people who were supposed to be followers of God. And in that person is God who is with us, who is hurt with us. If Jesus Christ can go through trials, then we know that the Bible's not teaching that we shouldn't. What he teaches is, I am with you. Keep your eyes on me. Just picture him grabbing your face, going, look here. The world's in chaos right now. Look here. Look here. Ask me how to deal with it. Focus on me. How would I deal with it? Watch me. Singled-mindedness on God's with usness. He is with you. Focus. Ask him, how would you have me be in this moment? Don't ask him to cut it short. Ask him to show you how to be like him. Ask you to show you the wisdom of how to deal with it. Because you know what? Even if you get through it today, it's coming again like a wave. See, James says this. He goes, God is not like man. God does not change like shifting shadows, is what he says. God does not change like shifting shadows, like Peter Pan. Every time you think you're going to get it, it moves. It's saying, you know, the comparison is the world you live in, the economy you live in, the countries you live in, it doesn't matter. They change like shifting shadows. As the sun rises, so goes the, the, the way life goes. It changes, it shifts, it never sits still, it is never enough. And it, and it says God does not change like shifting shadows, but guess what? You do. And that's the fundamental problem. You and I go with the every blowing wind in society, our ups and our downs. We doubt, we have faith, we love, we hate. And he says, but focus your eyes on Jesus. He does not change like shifting shadows. He's not shifty. You are, girl. God is not shifty. But you and I, we are. We getting shifty with it. Na 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 na. Your emotions are shifty. You love people one day, you love God one day, and it shifts. Your relationships are shifty. Your circumstances, like the world around us now, oh, are they shifty. If you're at home, look at your neighbor and say, you shifty? But also tell them, but God does not change like shifting shadows. So he says, focus on wisdom. Have faith in God's word. Focus on Christ with us. Proverbs says that wisdom is more valuable than any gold or any silver. Why is wisdom the thing that he says to come and ask for in the midst of trials and he will lavish it on you? Because wisdom helps you figure out how to live righteously and live rightly and live with even joy in the midst of trials. And wisdom helps you navigate good times as well. It doesn't matter if you're in the worst of times or the best of times. Wisdom tells you, God's wisdom tells you how to change and navigate. In good times, it tells you how to be humble and to be generous. In bad times, it tells you how to have joy and to have hope and how to be a light to others. Wisdom doesn't shift, so seek it with all that you have. See, when, when our focus is on Christ, we don't simply try to avoid problems. We ask, God, what are you trying to reveal in me in this moment? 
I'm going to sit with it. I'm going to dwell on it. It is not pleasant. I don't want it. What did Jesus say? He fell to his knees knowing he's about to go to the cross. And he sits there and he goes, if you will take this cup of suffering from me, then please do it. I don't want to go through it. But if I must for the salvation of others, if this is how you're going to bring salvation and perfection to the world, then Lord, your will be done. I am going to persevere. I am going to walk in it. That's what our, our Lord did. So we don't go to God saying, please God, help me avoid these problems. We say, God, I don't want this. I don't need this. But whatever happens, will you reveal the things in me, the things I put my hope in, the world, the politics, the government, the money, the job, whatever it is, reveal that thing into me, that in me that continues to wipe me away like shifting shadows and waves that are hitting me. Reveal those things that keep me spinning and turning and lost and broken. Bring them to the surface and get rid of them. What are you trying to reveal to me about the shallowness of my world? And what should I put my hope in? Give me your wisdom. What are you trying to reveal to me about my relationships? Give me wisdom. And then we ask for the wisdom of Christ. Jesus, in any given circumstance, how would we respond? How should we respond? And the wisdom of Jesus teaches us. How do you love when you're not being loved? And the wisdom of Jesus teaches us. How do you find identity when everything you thought gave you worth has fallen away? And the wisdom of Jesus helps you stay planted in shaky times because it teaches you how to find peace when there is chaos. When I am singularly focused on Christ's leading, I will not be blown back and forth by the winds of my problems. Jesus leads and is with us in good times and in bad. And every one of those moments is for your maturing so that you will lack nothing. That doesn't mean you're going to get everything that you think you need. That means you're going to get more than what you thought you needed. You're going to get wisdom to stand strong and have hope when everybody else has fallen apart. You're going to get peace when everybody has abandoned you. It's going to be supernatural because your eyes are set on the perfecter and the pioneer of your faith. That is maturity in faith. It doesn't mean you don't have concerns and you walk around going, everything's awesome. It doesn't mean you have to walk around happy all the time. Those religious people are so annoying. It means that in the middle of those times, you can look and say, like Jesus, I don't want this. This is awful. I am not enjoying this, but I am fixing my eyes on God. And then no matter what changes... Every problem is growing me in wisdom, is growing in me in maturity. I'm going to tell you, I have gone through a lot of stuff in my life. I have lost a daughter that I was supposed to be adopting. I I have lost every dollar to my nonprofit, thinking I was not going to have a job anymore of this thing I had built. We have faced trials and adoption and foster care. We have gone through muck. And most of the time, I don't have a lot of faith. I'm sitting there going, oh, what's going to happen? I had anxiety, and it was like years down the road where I'm going, you know what? I saw God in that 100% of the time later. Last year was one of the hardest years of my life, and it was the first time that I was in the middle of it. And I already could look and go, I can actually see how you're transforming me and changing me into who I need to be for the future. And that was the first time it wasn't, retroactive, looking backwards, going, oh, now I see God. I was sitting there going, I can actually see where you're going with this. And if you need me to sit in this, then let me sit in it. And I'll tell you, that was the first peace I've ever had that I knew was supernatural from Christ. When we are in the muck of it, We look at Jesus single-mindedly focused on him with us and go, what would you have me do in these circumstances? What do you want me to see? What do you want to reveal? See, this is faith. I used to struggle with faith, my friends. 
If you're watching and you struggle with faith, so do I. I always tell people, apart from the miraculous nature of God, I have an agnostic mind. I struggle with faith. And yet, when I became a Christian, here was the decision I made. I didn't say, oh, I have so much faith, I am just ready to do whatever God asks. I said, God, I doubt. God, I struggle. I don't know if I believe your word. The Bible, I struggle with the Bible. Like, all of this stuff makes me struggle. But I did sincerely say this. Here's what I'm going to do. I am going to go all in and try to do my best to do what it says. And if it says, love the poor, fine. If it says, give up your selfish ambitions to serve me, fine. I am going to do it, and I'm going to test you and see that if this is the right way, if this is the truth of the world, if this is true capital W wisdom, then it should play out the way you say. Not that my life would be perfect, but it should transform myself and others. And I had doubts, and I wavered like the sea, but I didn't waver in my commitment to do it. And you know what? God has been faithful. God is faithful because when you live the way he's leading you, even in your doubt, he reveals that he is the only steadfast thing you can count on. So this is faith. Not that you are so perfectly uh, like believing everything's going to happen exactly as you hope. This is faith. I don't know how you're going to get me through it, but I am sticking to it. I don't know how you'll get me through, but I am sticking with you. I don't see how this is good, but I am sticking with you, trusting that you're the only steadfast thing that can keep me. That is the leap of faith. And that's what leads us to what Jesus said. I thought, man, what a verse for a time like this. John 16, Jesus is talking to his disciples about his impending death on a cross. And he says, A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered each to your own home. Here we are. You will leave me all alone, yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. He is with us. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have many troubles. But take heart, I have overcome the world and all its wavering and all its shifting shadows. Focus on me, the only thing that doesn't shift with every turn of the earth. I have overcome the shiftiness of the world. I am with you. Eyes on me. Trust me. And you will have peace. And he says, not come to me and all things will work for you. He says, in this world, you will have many troubles. It's not what I desire of you. But keep your eyes on me and I will give you the wisdom of how to walk through it. And even find peace. Or as James says, true joy. Pure joy. So you can take heart, he says. You can find pros in problems and joys in trials, not because you desire to have problems. You don't, nobody wishes for it. But because by faith you know that Jesus can help you discover those fundamental flaws, those things that you were ignoring that nobody could have seen. You would have, there are things I would have never seen apart from the pain that I've walked through that God had to change in me, and I can never give it to him until it's brought to the surface. And that is faith. God, I don't want these trials, but whatever you have to do, let perseverance finish its work. Stick to it. And say, God, whatever you need to reveal, do so. I want your wisdom, and he will pour it out lavishly on you. Ask for wisdom, and he gives it liberally. Ask for a short-term fix, and that might be the worst thing you could get. But he says, if you ask for wisdom, you will lack nothing. You will find satisfaction is actually what that means. You will be satisfied in deserts and satisfied by streams of living water. 
doesn't matter what the situation, you will find satisfaction in God with you. If you're watching this, this is faith. And I, I tell you as one who's been an agnostic, I, I'm telling you, like, faith isn't this blind, you know, it is blind, but it's not this, like, I just believe and I'm just so holy. It's, sometimes it's grasping and it's holding and it's closing your eyes and saying, I'm going to do it. And I still struggle and I still doubt. God, I am hurting, but I'm going to throw myself in your withness. I'm going to choose to be with you. And if you are a struggling with belief, if you don't know God like that, I am telling you that when I have sat there and been in the arms of God, there is nothing that has given me peace in this world except for Him. And if that is you, there is an opportunity, whether you're on Facebook or on Redeemers online, which you can say, I want to give myself to the Lord and I will call you personally. You contact us and say, I want to try this faith thing and I personally will call you and touch base with you and talk to you and answer any questions I can to help you navigate this thing. But all it means is whatever you're walking through, if you are tired of the wavering of the sea, if you're tired of the constantly shifting world like whack-a-mole, every time you think you've solved one problem, a new one springs up, let me tell you that the Bible teaches us that is the way of the world for the rest of your life. But there is only one thing that stands firm. And if you can stick to it, you will find pure joy no matter the circumstance. And I am inviting you to make that decision now and I will be there to talk to you. If you'll pray with me. God, thank you for your word. One I've always struggled with. And yet it has always been faithful. Lord, I thank you that you are with us, that your willingness, unlike any other religion, your willingness to enter into the pain of humanity not only attests that the world is painful, but that you have, know the way through it. And that if we cling to you, single-mindedly clinging to you, Lord, that your wisdom will help us navigate that stuff. So, Lord, I pray for those who know you, but it's still experiencing that wavering back and forth, that faith of shifting shadows. Lord, that you will help them grow by your Holy Spirit in a faith that just trusts you with everything. For those who don't know you well and are still listening, God, I pray that you just make yourself known. I pray that they will give themselves wholeheartedly, even as a leap of faith, even in doubt, that they will give you their whole hearts and a shot to show them that you're the only sure thing. But Lord God, I pray for the maturity of believers too, for every one of us who is sitting in this word and watching and listening and reading the words of your brother James. Lord God, help us see that dross, that stuff, that garbage, that crap that just needs to get to the surface. Lord God, help purify that. Help us cling to the promise that it is in you that we lack nothing. Lord God, whatever that is for those listening at home, I pray that this will be a moment in time that they shift in how they see the world because you're speaking clearly to them through your spirit. I pray that we will be able to let go of those things we think are short-term fixes and cling to the perfecter of our faith, you. I pray for your spirit at work in these strange times. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God's peace and blessing with you. Stay right after this for a few challenges we're going to give you to follow up on with this sermon. Thanks. Hey, thanks for joining us for our sermon. I want to give you a few challenges to talk about after this that you can talk to friends, family, by text, or if you're watching this with somebody. Uh, here's a couple of things I want you to think about. I would love for you to take some time to jot down a few ideas of things that really changed your life, something that really impacted the way you saw the world, the way you grew up, uh, the way you saw faith, where you grew stronger and more mature. And, I, and I, I encourage you to write them down. Write down those things that really changed you and see what they have in common. What did they have in common? Were they difficult circumstances? What did they teach you? Uh, what was going on? Number two, what I want you to think about is 
I want you to think about things right now. What are problems you're facing right now? And as you look at them, uh, ask God to reveal ways in which you can see where he is showing you things in yourself, in your world. Maybe it's in systems you've trusted or things you put your hope in or things going on in your own spirit or faith. Ask him to reveal what your problems are showing you right now in your life and write those down and journal those as a prayer to God. And then lastly, I want to give you an active challenge. We're all facing a big problem right now. We're all uh, in shelter in place and stuck at home, but I am encouraging you to look at what are things I can do with friends or family to encourage one another in our faith. And I'm, I'm going to challenge you to think about two people, maybe it's in your family or people you know and love, and, and figure out how you can reach out and strengthen one another in, e in each other's faith in ways that you couldn't had this not happened. So those are my three challenges for you. Uh, write them down, take some time to pray over them, and I'd love to hear what God's doing in your life. Email me if you got anything that comes up, and I'd love to talk to you.